philosophies can shape our, our minds and our lifestyles to the extent that we begin to live in, in ways that are inconsistent with the gospel. And we've looked at several of these false narratives over here, and then we've replaced them with the good narratives that Jesus gives us through the gospel of how God wants us to live. And so as we wrap up our series on the good and beautiful God this morning, uh, let me just kind of remind us where we've been, what we've discovered about who God is. We've discovered that God is good. He's not angry with us. He's not kind of like waiting for us to mess up so he can zap us. We've discovered that God is generous, that he's not stingy. He doesn't wait for us to prove our value to him before he gives us good things. That God is trustworthy, we, we discovered. He's not fickle. He doesn't show favoritism. God is love. He, he loves us even though we do not love him back many times. God is holy and he abhors sin and its destructive influences in our lives. God is self-sacrificing and he takes the punishment of sin on himself so that we can have victory over sin and death. And then we discovered that God transforms us. That God comes and doesn't leave us where we are, but instead he fills us with the Spirit who then reshapes us into the image of Christ. And this morning we're going to close as we look at this final false narrative that God wants me to be busy doing his work. And instead, Jesus points out that God wants us to be in relationship with him, that the primary desire for God is that God wants us to be with him instead of doing for him. And so we're going to go to Luke chapter 10 for our scripture passage this morning. Luke chapter 10, it's a familiar story, the, the story of Mary and Martha. Many of you may have been thinking, well, that's probably where he's going to go this morning after what he's uh, been talking about in the, in the introduction. But this, this is a great story. It's a story of a family that really loved Jesus and supported him in his ministry. Uh, Mary and Martha's home was also the home of Lazarus. And we see Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead because he loved him. And he loved him so much that he wept over the news that Lazarus had died. This is a, a family that supported Jesus financially as well as showing him hospitality whenever he was in their area. They would say, come and stay at our house and rest and be refreshed here with us. And so it's not surprising that we find Jesus and his disciples making their way to Mary and Martha's house when they are in that vicinity. And here again in Luke chapter 10, starting with verse 38, we discover that very thing taking place. As Jesus and his disciples continued on their way to Jerusalem, they came to a certain village where a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. Her sister Mary sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he taught but Martha was distracted by the big dinner she was preparing. Thanksgiving week, right here. She came to Jesus and said, Lord, doesn't it seem unfair to you that my sister just sits here while I do all the work? Tell her to come and help me. But the Lord said to her, My dear Martha, you are worried and upset over all these details. There is only one thing worth being concerned about. Mary has discovered it, and it will not be taken away from her. Let's pray. God, this morning as we study your word, I pray that you would give us insight and understanding. I pray that you would cause your word to come to life for us today. And that as we hear from you, that as we hear the voice of the Spirit speaking into our lives, Lord, that we would also have the courage to let you apply that word to our lives. That we wouldn't leave here and just go about life the same way as we did before we came in, but that we would leave here and we would go about life a little differently because we've met with you today. And so speak, Lord, your servants are listening. Amen. Busyness is godliness. Some of you are wondering, is that true or is that not true? Some of you are, are trying to figure out, is, is, he, is he serious when he says that, or is, he, or is he trying to kind of come behind the scenes at us? I, I, I don't think that that's a true statement, but, but that's a statement that oftentimes we live by, isn't it? To be busy is to be seen as more godly, especially if our busyness is doing God's stuff. It's amazing to me. Uh, it, it's probably not amazing, but it, it, I find this, this conversation taking place many times where I will sit down with somebody and we will be talking about uh, life and, and they'll be sharing with me some of the things that they do in the, in the life of the church and where they help out and what they've done in the past. And, 
And then a comment, something along the lines of this will we'll be going, well, we don't do as much as you do, pastor, but we do our best, or something along those lines, right? And so automat- underneath the surface, there's kind of this stratification of value in that us pastors are more valuable to God and, 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 and more uh, impressive to God because our very job in and of itself is to be doing the work of God where you guys only get to do that on, uh, outside of your regular work or, or you, know, you don't get to do as much here in the church. And so you're not as valuable to God as the pastors are. And some of you are thinking, I don't like that too well. Like that doesn't, that doesn't really jive with me this morning. But, but that's how we sometimes operate. We think that if people are really busy doing good stuff for God, that somehow they're more important to God. That that's what makes them more valuable. And we, and we kind of classify ourselves based on our busyness for God. We don't like what the result of that is, but that's often how we operate in our thinking. We put busyness, doing all these good things for God, uh, at, on kind of the same bar as godliness or Holiness, we might use a term there. Now, it's no wonder that we do this because we live in a culture that values busyness. In 2012, Ray Williams, who's a psychologist, wrote this in the journal Psychology Today. He says, talk to almost anyone today, and they complain about having no time, about being too busy. But now we also equate that busyness to productivity and a characteristic of a successful life. If you talk to somebody who isn't busy, you think that they're lazy. Right? I mean, we just automatically draw that conclusion in our culture. Like, if you don't have 18 things on your phone and three things that are, like, at the same time that you haven't figured out how you're going to be at both things at the same time yet, but you're still, you haven't, like, eliminated any of those things from your calendar to do yet, we think that you're pretty awesome. Like, we're like, wow, how do they do all of that? They must be really good. They're really important. They're really valuable. Because we base our value on our productivity. That's how our culture bases value. That's why in the culture, people are less concerned about things like euthanasia because we're talking about people who can't produce anything. They're not productive anymore. You know, so, so we, we, all, we already are, are kind of like shoving people who are not productive off into the margins. You know, we, we marginalize them. We put them away in places where other people can take care of them and they don't slow us down. Because we value productivity. And when you become unproductive, you become less valuable. And, and that's not just in the culture, is it? It's here in the church, too. Oftentimes, we, we evaluate people's worth based on what they can do, not on who they are. When I was a kid growing up, we didn't have a TV, and so we listened to a lot of music on the radio and tapes and things like this. And uh, so, yeah, I was old enough that they had tapes. They didn't have CDs yet. Some of you, you know, that's like, well, I was old. You know, when I was old, they didn't even have tapes. They had what, you know, we had vinyl and then, oh, you know, whatever. But anyways, uh, we had, <laughs> it's second service. My mind's starting to go, you know. Um, so we had, we had these tapes, and, and one of these tapes was uh, songs that animals would sing about their characteristics. And so there was a song about a beaver. It was something like, it's so great to be, be, be a beaver. To be a big, a chee, 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 achiever. There's no job too big for me. I just do it cheerfully. It's so great to be a beaver. I don't slow down, don't fool around. You know, and, uh, and, the, and, the, and the, the message of the song kind of like sunk into me, right? Like, so I became like this person who, who would always be looking to do. My, when my parents would go away, I, I was the one who would be put in charge of the farm. And my brothers hated it. Because dad would give us a list of five things and I would bring out a list of seven things. Like I, there was, I was going to do more than what dad had on his list, you know, because I was an overachiever. I was going to be the one who did more because to do more was to be worth more. I had bought into this lie that the culture has put onto us. And Martha had bought into this lie. Martha bought into this too. Jesus comes to town to visit Martha, and Martha is so consumed with making sure that his visit is pleasant and that she maintains a positive reputation as being a super hostess, 
that she misses the whole point of Jesus coming to town. She's all consumed with the meal. Now, let me just stop and say very quickly that doing good is good. And working for Jesus is good and valuable, and we need people to volunteer. If we get inundated with calls on Monday for people canceling on their service, like saying we're no longer going to serve in the church, you missed the point of this message, okay? That's not what we want to have happen. We need you to be serving in the church, absolutely. But sometimes we take our value from that service. And I want us to think about, instead of placing our value on service, where should our value be placed? And sometimes there, there, there are maybe one or two of you who are serving so much that you do need to back away from a few things. But, but, the, but doing good and serving is good. We need that. And Jesus instructs us to be servants, to be out there doing good and to be ministering and using our gifts in the church. He tells us to do that. So, so this is not a message about don't do anything. It's a message of realigning our priorities Doing good is good. But at the same time that I, that I want to emphasize that, I'm also confronted with the reality that Jesus rebukes Martha. He says, Martha, what you've chosen is not the best. And as a Martha, I understand that. And it hurts. It stings. Jesus implies that Martha is wrong to be consumed with the work and that what Mary has chosen is something better. And what is Mary doing? Nothing! Right? She's just sitting there. Martha's running around, getting everything done, cooking, setting the table, hauling the water, making sure that you know, all the cobwebs are out of the corner, making sure there's enough chairs at the table and the name tags are right and, and that the, uh, you know, the turkey is, is, is basted properly and, and making sure that the decorations are all proper and that the, you know, the acorns are on the table and all, all that Thanksgiving stuff. Martha's doing all of it. And there's Mary doing nothing. Nothing! She's just sitting there. Sitting there listening to Jesus tell stories. I'd be upset too. And yet, Jesus tells Martha, listen, what Mary has chosen is better. It's better. I think it's easier to do stuff for Jesus than to be with Jesus. It's often easier to do stuff for people than to be with them, isn't it? We, we did the missions weekend a few weekends ago. Many of you were part of that. We had people that went up to City Mission in Buffalo. We had people that uh, went out to various agencies uh, around our communities. And the group that I was with, uh, we went down to this uh, individual's home in a trailer park. And he, uh, the fence around his, his property had, had come into disrepair and needed to be replaced. And there were some skirting issues and some stuff that needed to be cleaned up. And so we went down ahead of time and we looked it over and thought saw what needed to be done, and we made a list, and we brought our tools, and we got there early, and, and the guy that, that owned the, the house, uh, he works nights, and so he was kind of in the, in, in the house sleeping, and he kind of came out and talked to uh, the Normans, who were our group leaders, and, and said, you know, all right, I, hear, I see that you're here, and then he went back in, and he went to bed, and, and uh, so we're trying to be quiet while we're doing all this, you know, weed whacking and all this stuff around the house, and Felt sorry for the guy, but, but we had this, this you know, list of things to do, and so I'm out there, and I'm digging holes for the post, and we're going to get this new fence put in, and, and the neighbors come over, right? And, and they're kind of talking to a few people on the side, and, and, uh, and I'm digging a hole, and, you know, and I'm doing something over here, and I look over, and, and there's like two people just talking to the neighbor. And I'm thinking, we've got stuff to do. Right? I mean, we, we got to get these weeds out of here. We got to get this fence in, you know, and there's supposed to be a luncheon bag. We got we to gotta timeline. We can't spend time talking to the neighbors until we get the work done. <laughs> Martha has chosen what is better. Ouch. Being with people is harder than doing for people because when you're with people, they tell you their stories. And now you've got to carry that emotional burden. You've got to get involved in the drama. 
You gotta, you gotta like let some of that emotional impact touch your life and your heart, and all of a sudden you can't just be at a distance, right? It's it's easier to be relational from a distance, right? It's it's kind of like grandparenting. We have some of the kids with us today, and we love having them. It's also nice to send them home. <laughs> And we like to be that way with people too, don't we? It's hard to let people into your life because you know it's going to rob you of more than your time and your money. It's going to rob you of part of your soul. It's a heavy burden to carry the burdens of people who walk with you through life and that you allow yourself to walk with. Being is more difficult than doing. But I've discovered that if I just do, I seldom will be with people. If I allow myself to be with people, I always end up doing too. If you're with someone first, then you'll do for them because you can't be with people and not do for them. And so what, is, what does Jesus tell Martha? Jesus tells Martha, listen, you've got the priorities backwards. It's not that doing is bad. It's that doing must emerge from being. When we are with people, then that mutual relationship instructs us and informs and shapes how we do and what we do for them so that it becomes legitimately and realistically helpful and beneficial to them because it comes out of this relationship of love that is already established. This is what Jesus is telling Martha. Be with me first. And out of that relationship, the avenues of service will open up and become obvious. Being with Jesus is also the only way that the narratives of Jesus can saturate our lives. Doing things for God allows us to keep our old narratives because we don't give Jesus time enough to change them. We're not with him long enough, but when we are with him, he changes our narratives because those narratives begin to soak through our defenses. Anybody here make pickles? Any pickle makers out there? Yeah, we got some pickle makers out there. Uh, well, I brought some, some dill pickles in today. And, uh, you know, dill pickles are, 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 are good pickles. They're, they're pretty tasty. Um, and, uh, yep, yeah, that's a good dill pickle. Any pickle lovers out there? Anybody love pickles? You love pickles? Can you help me for a minute? Come on up here. Remind me, tell me what your name is. Um, Will. Will? All right, Will. You're going to be, you're going to preach the sermon for me today, okay? So this is, it's really going to be really easy. You love pickles, right? So here's your towels, because we, we try not to drip pickle juice on the floor, or else uh, Ron back there gets mad at me and <laughs> tells me. So one, can you reach in and grab a pickle? Grab a pickle there, Will. And whichever one you want. And then uh, go ahead and take a bite of your pickle. Tell me, tell me, tell me what that tastes like. Does it taste like a dill pickle? Mm -hmm. Does it taste good? You like that? Do you like cucumbers? Mm -hmm. Yeah? Well, for those of you that know how to make a pickle, right, you start with a cucumber, right? So step just over here just a second, a little bit, so I don't like pre step on top of you. So you start with a cucumber. And uh, you take that cucumber and you wash it, and uh, this cucumber's been washed. Now, you like cucumbers, right? Could you, t could you take a bite of that and tell me what that tastes like? What does that taste like? Cucumber? Cucumber? Is it a good cucumber? There's nothing wrong with it. Tastes like a good cucumber? Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, we're going to take that cucumber. Could you dip your cucumber in here? Just, just dip it in there. We don't have another service, so you, either one, e either way. I don't care if you dip in the, bite, the end you bit off of it, either way. No, hold it in there. We've got we to let it soak a little bit, right? So, so we're, we're going to put that cucumber in here because that's how you make a pickle, right? You take a pickle and you stick it in the, in the, in the brine, 
in the juice, right? And then it turns into a pickle, right? So, all right, that, that should be good. Go ahead. Uh, take a bite of that end and tell me, what does that taste like? Pickle. It tastes like a pickle? Mm -hmm. Does it taste like cucumber pickle or more cucumber or more pickle? Cucumber pickle. More cucumber? There's more cucumber than there is pickle, you think, at that, at that point? Mm -hmm. So you've just preached the sermon, okay? You actually can keep those pickles and you can, you can have them. That's good. <laughs> Thanks, Will. The question is, why did Will's cucumber still taste like a cucumber even though it went to church for 15 seconds? I mean, it was immersed in the juice for, for, for Sunday service. But it still tasted like a cucumber. Why do we expect our lives to somehow radically be transformed if we don't allow ourselves to stay in the pickle jar more than just a service on Sunday? A cucumber takes four to six weeks to turn into a pickle. Don't you think it would take us a little longer to turn into what Jesus wants us than an hour on Sunday? Don't you think if we're really going to let the narratives of God shape who we are, that like a cucumber turned into a pickle, we might need to sit in the juice a little bit longer. That we might actually need to be with Jesus more than just being dipped into the juice and then going out and doing all of our stuff and coming back and dipping in the juice and going out and doing our stuff. And Maybe we need to just sit in the jar to be with Jesus. It's not easy being with Jesus because when you allow your life to be set into the pickle jar of Christ, he will confront those false narratives in your life. He's going to point them out and he's going to begin to point out things in your life that he wants to change. Seasonings that, that he begins to soak into your life that, that radically alter who you are on the inside. And it's not easy to change. It's not easy to be confronted with the things that I like but that God doesn't like present in my life. But if you're in the pickle jar of Jesus, he's going to do that. In the pickle jar of Jesus, you will be confronted with the reality that you are not doing anything, but yet you're still valuable to God. And that your value doesn't come from your productivity, but from who you are, that you are a wonderful creation of a holy God. That he doesn't like you because of what you do. He likes you because of who you are. Dallas Willard says, God doesn't get out of us what we do. He gets out of us who we become. What do you take to heaven? Who you are. Not what you do. And the third thing that makes the pickle jar uncomfortable is that you will have to learn to wait. And waiting is never fun. But throughout the Bible, we find instruction to wait. And the scripture tells us that those who wait upon the Lord will renew their strength. And those who wait upon the Lord will mount up on wings as, as eagles. And that those who wait upon the Lord will, will run and not grow weary. And that those who wait upon the Lord will walk and not be faint. In other words, that those who learn to wait, who allow the juice of Christ to saturate them, will be transformed into the people that God wants them to be. They will be victorious. They'll become good pickles. This morning I want to ask you, are you a pickle? Or are you still a cucumber that's just being dipped into the pickle juice every now and then? You know, Thanksgiving is a great time for us to put this into practice. It's a time where you're going to be with people. And might I encourage you this week 
to focus more on being with than doing for. To, to, to take the time to, to just sit and to be with your family instead of running around and trying to find a ton of activities for them to do just to be together and to listen and to, I, I got some stones in first service, so I'm ducking, but to turn the football game off for a little while, let the DVR take that and just be with them, to be together you can watch that game later, but you can't watch Thursday later. To be, to be with, instead of to do for. Because when we focus on being with, God releases our do fours in more substantial and transformative ways. Because it comes out of the heart. It comes out of a relationship, both with him and with those around us. Are you a pickle? Or are you still just a cucumber? Let's pray. God, this morning I pray that you would continue to shape me, continue to shape us. Father, give us the courage to allow ourselves to sit in your presence, to not keep running away from you to do stuff, but to just sit with you, to be with you, and to allow our doing to emerge from that relationship and not from a sense of obligation. I pray that you would help us as we interact with our families this week, Lord, to, to be with them more than to do for them. And God, that we would value their relationship and the value that comes from just being together. Show us, Lord, how you have designed us for that deep intimacy and relationship. And out of that, Lord, then open up opportunities for your love to be expressed in powerful ways. Help us to be pickles and not just cucumbers. In Jesus' name, amen. Go this week to love and serve the Lord. The Lord is with you. Are you with him as you go this week? Amen.